everyone. Welcome to our virtual artist talk. My name is Megan. I'm the marketing and events coordinator here at the Vernon Public Art Gallery. As a cultural institution, I would just like to respectfully acknowledge that I'm located on unceded and ancestral territory of the Felix people. Tonight, I am very happy to introduce to you Lisa Mathias, an Edmonton-based artist with degrees in botany and biological sciences, paired with a master's degree in fine arts, brings a scientific view to her exhibition, Field Marks. Utilizing the simple process of woodcut prints, Matthias's work is both intricate and large in scale, providing the viewer with a glimpse into ecological subject matter while challenging the scale of working within the medium of woodcut printmaking. This talk will be recorded and uploaded to our YouTube channel, so if you feel comfortable, please turn on your mic and camera at the end of the talk during our question and answer period to ask Lisa a question. I will also be taking questions in the chat if you prefer that route. Without further ado, please give a warm virtual welcome to Lisa Mathias. Uh, great, thanks, Megan. Uh, I'm going to share my screen here. Um, got a bunch of images lined up to show you while I'm talking. How does that look for you all? Oh, good, okay, great. Um, so thanks for attending. I see um, my mother-in-law here. I have Olympic through <laughs> coming in. <laughs> um, uh, I'd also like to uh, let you know that I'm speaking to you here from Treaty 6 territory uh, and Métis Nation of Alberta Region 4, just west, just west of Edmonton. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Canada Council for the Arts for its support of my work and this exhibition, and also to the Vernon uh, Public Art Gallery for the opportunity to share my work uh, with people who live in and are visiting, or were visiting um, the North Okanagan this summer. Uh, attending, I attended the opening reception myself uh, mid-August, it was my first time visiting Vernon, and I was totally overwhelmed by the beauty of it, like the sagebrush covered grasslands overlooking the city. <clears throat> um, I explored Kalamalka Lake Provincial Park for a day, um, just a, such a beautiful area. Uh, and then like a few days after I returned home to Edmonton from Kelowna, the McDougal Creek wildfire erupted in West Kelowna. And um, I mean, it's so tragic in so many ways. I guess as an introduction to the talk, I hope like artwork that addresses these sort of environmental themes has some meaning for people, like with all the ecological and climate related grief that people are feeling these days, I hope that environmental art can be, um, I don't know, wholesome meaning for people. So I titled this uh, exhibition Field Marks. Uh, most of my printmaking work is like, it's all about mark making for me, and it's all about like being out in the field and studying biology, but also field marks is a term we use in bird watching. Um, it refers to like the different colors or shapes or patterns or marks on different species of birds that both bird watchers and birds are like used to distinguish one another. So I'm gonna start by talking about like the body of work in the show <clears throat> that's mostly about birds. Although there's um, actually like four years worth of my work kind of represented in the exhibit um, from several different bodies of work. Uh, but I'm gonna start with the most recent stuff I've been working on this year, which is these bird bird nest prints. Um, so it was hard to find photos of myself bird watching, but this is all I found. I stuck them all on this one screen. Um, I've been bird watching for over 25 years. Um, a lot of that as a professional wildlife biologist, like doing different studies on birds. Um, and then a lot of it as an artist or just as a pastime as well. Um, and it's something like that anybody can do. Um, it's most fun if you have a pair of binoculars, but you can also just like, you know, looking at your bird feeder and observing behaviors of birds. Um, a lot of people like to learn to identify different species. And that's something that I often encourage people to do when I talk to them about bird, bird watching. And I've had friends ask me like, where do I even start? And I always recommend just like starting with one species at a time. So if you're like out on a nature walk or something somewhere and you, you hear a song and or see a bird and wonder what it is, like record it or document it, and then just try to figure out that one bird. And if you just like, you know, do just simplify it one thing at a time, then, you know, over time you can learn all about the diversity of birds around you. And anyways, I think it's like 
I've been doing it for a long time and I still learn new things every day about it. And so it's a really fun pastime. So, um, so since I've been doing all that for so long, um, it was inevitable, I think, that <clears throat> I start to make work um, exploring birds in one way or another. Uh, so this is a blue jay nest that I found like 10 years ago. It was falling out of a, a white spruce tree near my house in Edmonton. Um, and I've held on to it ever since. It's in like, you know, my boxes of studio supplies. But I had a feeling one day I'd do something with it. And so um, like late last year, earlier this year, I just this was kind of the starting point for looking at bird nests. I've always I think when I found this one. Um, I was just so taken by, I think it's just a, it's such a beautiful object, right? But also it's covered in all these human made materials. Um, you can see like a zip tie and a straw wrapper and there's some like plastic covered wire. And around the other side, there's some ribbon and it's all like these sort of decorative pieces put around it, which I thought was so intriguing. Um, anyway, so I collected a long time ago. Um, songbirds generally don't reuse their nests, so I'm not taking something that this bird is going to use again. And that's because there's like a risk of um, like parasites in the nest, like lice and stuff, and they wouldn't want to pass that on to a new uh, brood the next year. They might, they're very um, loyal to their nesting sites though, so I think birds might use some of the materials out of old nests. Um, but to back up even more, um, I don't want to encourage nest collecting as a hobby. It's against the law, for one thing. Um, birds and their nests and their habitats, even if they're not using the nests anymore, are protected um, under the Migratory Birds Convention Act in Canada. Um, that was enacted in like 1917, after, like shortly after the last passenger pigeon died. I don't know if you've heard, all heard of the passenger pigeon story. Um, you know, like 100 plus years ago, North America was covered in billions of passenger pigeons. And then one day people had hunted them until there was not a single one left. Like a tragic story of like endangered species in Canada and the US. Um, anyway, so you can't go collect nests. Even if you find a nest that's been wind blown out of a tree, you're not supposed to take it. So um, when I was starting this work, I talked to a, an officer with Environment Canada about getting a research permit for, for looking at nests. And anyways, that's one little. Um, uh, research pathway that I followed. I'm going to talk a bit more about that in a minute. Uh, so one of the first prints I made for this series was of this blue jay nest. Um, so this is like a three by four foot woodcut print. Uh, it's a bit of a departure from some of my previous work and that it's like, it's pretty realistic. I mean, it's still very graphic and flat, black and white. Um, these sort of characteristics that have always drawn me to printmaking to begin with. Um, but it is much more realistic than some of the other work in the show, other than the bird nest stuff. Um, and I don't know what I, I can tell you about it. The scale of the carving is still quite large. Like a lot of the work that I do, I like that I can make energetic mark making. Um, it's like it's woodcut printmaking is also kind of sculptural. Essentially, you're doing like a, a very low relief, two to, like almost two dimensional sculpture on the surface of a piece of plywood. Um, Anyways, uh, I'm going to get back into like a bit of the research that went into this work before I show too many more uh, pieces. So while I was pursuing like getting a, a research permit for collecting nests, I knew that our um, the Royal Alberta Museum in Edmonton had a big nest collection there. So I arranged to go visit the ornithology department and spent a day with, this was about a year ago, um, last fall with uh, Dr. Jocelyn Poudon, who's the um, curator of ornithology there. And so they have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of local bird nests from the past, like, you know, 50, 100, 100 plus years. Um, these big storage cabinets with these wooden trays, like full of nests and eggs. Um, of course, today is like all sorts of ethical questions about this kind of collecting. A lot of these specimens are like from the early 1900s and stuff. And, Apparently, back in that day, it was a thing to collect and trade wild songbird eggs. Um, anyways, it's a sort of pastime. Uh, so uh, I took over 600 photographs, reference photos of the collection. I was just totally overwhelmed. I had to focus on some groups that I really wanted to photograph. Um, on the left here, those neat clay structures. Um, you might have seen them before. Like cliff swallows make these 
like muddy clay things and like tuck their nests inside. Um, these are just a couple of examples. On the right are some marsh wren nests. Um, there's just a few more random ones. Uh, there's all sorts of them here. The one with my hand in it's a chipping sparrow. I find them a lot in the spruce trees where I live. And they're often lined with, um, we have horses. Our neighbors have horses and are often lined with horse hair in the, in the middle. There's usually a soft sort of lining in the center of most bird nests where the eggs go. Um, and the white crown sparrow on the dot bottom right, and the Phoebe and Wood Peewee. Um, all sorts of like beautiful diversity uh, in these nests. Um, so I like, I love them as objects. I love them as like remnants of the bird behavior. Um, so there are so many things there I, I really wanted to look at. There are a few group, groups going there that I wanted to look at, including hummingbirds and orioles, just because I knew they both had really interesting nest structures that I wanted to look at. Here's a few examples of different hummingbird species. Um, uh, I've got one with my hand there to show you. They're very tiny little, like to me size nests with even tinier little eggs in them. Um, and then I also included a photo here of a barn swallow um, kind of related to the cliff swallow, but it's an there's so many interesting stories to each of these nests and species. Um, the barn swallow is an example of a bird. It's an aerial insectivore, um, a bird that experienced like significant decline in North America from like well, in the 1980s to the 2000s. It was listed as a threatened species. It was once like um, super common, and then with use of like pesticides. Um, and like climate change related increasing frequency of temperature fluctuations during spring migration, uh, these birds experience like severe declines. Uh, fortunately, in the last 20 years, they're starting to do a little bit better in some places anyways. Um, so anyways, there's a backstory to like everything there. There's so much to explore. So it was really a uh, rich experience for me to be able to go do that at the museum. So the biggest print in this show is this 15 foot long woodcut, which I call the ornithology collection. Um, like I said, I was overwhelmed with everything that I saw during that like one day museum trip. Um, but I chose, uh, I decided to pick just a few species that I had some kind of personal connection with um, to put in this kind of landscape of nests. Um, I wanted it to kind of feel like you're walking through a forest. It, like I placed them in, they're kind of floating, but in this like forest-like landscape um, as kind of like a counter to the storage cabinets where the actual specimens are kept. Um, also like it, it stands out, the fact that all these nests are empty. So they're kind of remnants of something. Makes me think of, um, I don't know if any of you have seen like these Victorian cabinets with like taxidermy birds like they've made these beautiful scenes where people just collected and killed and stuffed birds it's kind of like the remains of that um anyways it's I, I, I haven't really had time to reflect on it too much but definitely the biggest piece I've ever made um it just kind of made itself really quickly it was just fun putting these nests together it was three three big um five foot pieces of plywood that I put together and then printed on the floor on a giant uh, one sheet of paper. I'll talk a bit more about the process that I use for these um, a few slides from now, uh, after I finish talking about birds and kind of nerding out on the bird ecology part. Uh, so I mentioned one of the other species I really wanted to look at was Baltimore Orioles. So um, this is an example of an Oriole nest. Uh, so it's like this, um, this really like this woven hanging basket the female oriole spends a week building it. And each individual like piece of grass or whatever is like expertly like woven in between all the other ones. Um, this particular specimen I'm showing here is from the 1960s from right near where I live, a couple kilometers down the street. And apparently somebody collects it from there. Uh, this is another neat one that was at the museum, uh, oriole nests made entirely of fishing line. Um, Orioles normally nest somewhere near wetlands. Um, and apparently it's not that uncommon for them to use human-made materials like this. Normally fishing line would be like fatal to most wildlife, but somehow the Oriole made this nest out of it, even with these hooks and everything in there. So it's kind of a, well, totally fascinating object. Um, this is an example of Baltimore, Baltimore Oriole habitat. Uh, the little inset photo 
you can see kind of a dark ball in the trees there. That's a oriole nest. This is the first time I've seen an oriole nest in the wild. Um, this is from Point Peewee National Park. I was there in June this year doing a short artist residency, um, just a research kind of week um, I spent there. It's an international bird watching destination. Like every May, tens of thousands of bird watchers descend on this tiny little national park. It's the southernmost tip of mainland Canada and it's on the north shore of Lake Erie. And so during the spring migration, like all these birds are flying over Lake Erie on their way to the boreal forest where most of them are going to breed. Um, and so they fly across the lake and then they hit land and they kind of drop, you know, to rest from the big trip across. So on Point Peel, you get this big like descent of all these birds and the trees. Um, it's kind of a fascinating place. Um, most of it's marshland. Um, when I was there in June, I saw like tons of species that I've never seen before in my life. So it's like totally in heaven for me the whole week. It was amazing. Um, this habitat here, so there's the Baltimore Oriole. Uh, I only saw that nest. It was it, the tree on the right. It's in that. It was in that tree. And I only saw it because I saw the the Oriole fly into it, and then realized there was a nest there. I was actually there looking at the trees on the left. You can't quite see it, but there's a there's a cavity in those trees um, that has a nest of a prothonotary warbler. It's an endangered warbler that I've never seen before. Um, that only exists there in Ontario. Um, it's one of two cavity nesting warblers in North America. Anyways, it was just fascinating watching those birds, the male was going to the cavity, um, bringing through to the female who was sitting on eggs, or sorry, um, in the nest. And then there's also an, um, I don't have a photo of it here, but just above where this photo is showing, there's an indigo bunting, which is this beautiful bright blue bird, and it was singing its heart out. Um, so really biodiverse special place. Um, so I, um, for my week there, I took tons of photos and videos and sound recordings. Uh, in addition to printmaking, I do some other things in my studio as well, other creative practices, including a lot of like uh, recording ecological sounds um, and soundscapes. So I recorded, you know, hours worth of uh, bird song when I was there um, to do something with in the future for some sound work. Uh, here's a print of an oriole nest. Um, again, it's like, for me, it feels quite realistic, but it is still have this flat graphic quality to it. This is three by four feet as well. And this is the uh, same size of a species called a red-eyed vireo. Uh, I think this was actually the first one I did in the series, and this was of uh, American robin nest, which is probably a nest that lots of people have seen before. If they're a nature type of people who go on walks and look for birds. Um, another species I looked at for a print and want to talk about is the yellow warbler. It's also a common prairie species that a lot of people would have heard before, if not um, seen. Uh, if you're going for a walk anywhere, like the parkland in, you know, um, probably BC, Alberta, Manitoba, Saskatchewan. Um, they're supposed to, if you put words to the song, it's supposed to say, sweet, 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 I'm so sweet. But once you learn it, so if you Google Yellow Warbler after this and listen to its song um, and get sort of like a search image for the song in your head, you'll hear it all the time when you're out in the summer. Anyways, uh, I, this is the type of nest I encounter most often when I'm outside, like blown out of a tree on a trail. I'll see these nests on the ground. Um, around where I live, this is how they make them. It's usually grass, like stuffed with uh, balsam poplar fluff. Um, and one of the reasons I think I find them on the ground is because this one in the image here, it's actually three nests built right on top of one another. And the birds did that because this big egg out, popping out of the end is um, something called a brown-headed cowbird egg. It's known as a brood parasite. So cowbirds don't actually build their own nests. They just lay their eggs in the nests of other species. And they do this to over like 200 different species. It's just something that they've evolved to do. I'll talk about that in a second. But um, the yellow warbler is one of, I don't know if there's any other species that know this, but yellow warblers can identify if there's a cowbird egg in their nest. And if they see one there, they'll abandon that nest and just build another nest right on top of the first one. So this one, about half a 
happened a few times and you have this sort of ice cream cone of um, nests one on top of each other. Uh, I think the ecology and, of the warbler and, and the cowbird and the cowbirds and other species is just fascinating. The brown-headed cowbird, um, it evolved like uh, it's had this type of symbiosis with the plains bison that used to roam across the prairies. Um, it's a type of relationship called commensalism where the the birds would follow, the cowbirds would follow the herds of bison around and the bison would flush out insects from the vegetation and the birds would eat, feed on that. So they're benefiting from hanging out with the bison. But because they had this like roaming around lifestyle, they didn't have time to, to build a nest and, and rear a clutch. So they evolved to just drop their eggs into their bird nests, which is really fascinating to think. Anyways, that's a lot of background about yellow warblers and brown cowbirds. Um, so I made this big uh, five foot long woodcut of a yellow warbler nest. And this one is way more abstract than the other ones. This is like the type of visual language I feel really comfortable with. I just, you know, have this image of a cowbird nest in my head. And when I have a, a woodcut that I want to start, I have a big piece of plywood. And usually I use brush and ink um, to just sort of paint on the image that I want to start with. And then the carving is sort of its own process from there. The image like evolves a lot from the original painted on image when I start carving. Um, so it's very flat and graphic and abstracted. Um, and it's totally my style, this kind of abstractedness. But uh, I was going for realism with some of the other ones because I really, I wanted people to be able to identify that what I was showing in the woodcuts and that there were nests. If you saw this on your own without the other prints around it, I don't know if it would be clear that it was a nest, um, maybe. Anyway, so this is my interpretation of looking at some of those yellow warbler nests. Um, and similarly, another like kind of abstracted graphic one is, this is the same size as the yellow warbler one and it's of a yellow headed blackbird. <clears throat> um, and again, if you just saw this on your own, I don't know if you'd necessarily see a nest in it, maybe. Um, but anyways, I enjoy the sort of movement and the mark making in both those. Um, okay, so I think that's all I'm going to talk about for nests, because like, like I mentioned, there's a few different bodies of work um, in the show. So if you have any questions about birds, bird ecology, any of the stuff I've rambled on about, um, just keep it in mind for the end, or you can put the questions in the chat, and we'll get to that after I'm done talking. So this series was on a, a different wall. Just these three pieces are on the are on the wall in the gallery, um, and they're from 2020. And it was from I think there was about I'm trying to think how many pieces were in this body of work that I made, like 12 to 15. I can't remember the exact number. Um, the piece in the middle is the biggest one called um, the meadow, and it's uh, at 10 feet long by three and a half feet tall, and then two other five foot pieces beside it. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about this work. Um, which do I have? So Megan mentioned at the beginning that I have a degree in botany. So that's true. I uh, I studied plant ecology and uh, I'm just a generalist ecologist. I love whether it's insects or uh, microscopic zoological phytoplankton or zooplankton or plants. Uh, there's just so many rabbit holes you can go down to go through. Uh, this is one rabbit hole I went down into for a couple of couple of years, starting in 2020 around the beginning of the pandemic. Um, we were we were all like stuck at home for periods of time back then, um, and so. <clears throat> like in the early spring that year, I remember um, spending a lot of time looking at dandelions and this other related wildflower in my yard, orange hawkweed and the insects that were pollinating them and, and just randomly sticking stuff under the microscope and looking at it. Um, <clears throat> so in the top left here is like a little close up of a microscope slide where I dissected a dandelion a little bit and stuck some of these reproductive flower parts on there. Um, if you look at a close up of a dandelion, that flower head is actually, um, it's called an inf inflorescence and a bunch of different flowers all stuck together. Each of the little flowers, it's called a ray floret. Um, and uh, the female reproductive 
parts. There's a few different parts, but one of the stigma on top, you probably remember this from like high school biology or um, those curly little parts are called the stigma and they're on top of the style. And then the kind of puffy part um, lower down on that little stem is the anther. Uh, and then close up on the right here is under a light microscope, just looking at those stigmas a little bit closer. And I don't know, I just found that just the form of this sort of bilobed reproductive organ, it's sort of like, you know, an ovary or something. I was just really fascinated by the shapes of it. And I dissected so many of these dandelions. Um, I also, like I mentioned, looking at this related species called orange broccoli. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just getting over it. Um, <clears throat> this is actually one of my favorite wildflowers. It's where I live, and I think probably most places in Canada, it's listed as a noxious weed. So if it grows on our property, we have to destroy it. So I usually do that by picking it and putting it in bouquets around the house. Um, and so like back in 2020, during the beginning of COVID, we were stuck at home a lot and ended up just putting a bunch of this under the microscope too and looking at the different floral parts. There's um, the petals that are like fused into this like five lobed um, single petal. It looks like kind of these little fingers on the hand. All, anyways, all sorts of like really interesting shapes in there that I was just drew over and over again in drawings and looked at in photographs. Um, so this 10 foot long piece sort of came from all of that microscopy work. Um, this is my favorite print that I've made <clears throat> ever. I only have one copy of it because it's really hard to print. But other than the printing part, um, the drawing and carving and everything, it just sort of made itself. Like sometimes work just, um, it just made, it was like, it wasn't hard at all. It just kind of came together. I didn't think about it. It just did it. Um, and so I don't know if it's that or what about it that I'm really drawn to. I There's all these recurring botanical forms in here um, that I like. It's the scale of it, like, and the shape of it. It's kind of like a giant blown up micros microscope slide. Um, I was doing these sort of washes on microscope slide, like squishing all these flower parts down. So it's kind of like a giant blown up version of that. Um, when you first look at it, it's super abstract. Uh, like say compared to like the blue jay nut that I did. Um, but that's just, I think the nature of the subject, like um, this is really what these things kind of look like under the microscope, but just these forms are not things that people look at every day at that sort of scale. Um, what else can I tell you about that? Um, this was the first one I did in that series. Just a big giant portrait of those stigmas and styles. That's super expressive. Um, and uh, same with this one. Um, I think when I'm carving these, like a lot of the times, like I'm just, it's totally like a meditative state. But I think like a print this big, about five, five feet tall, like a woodcut this size, <clears throat> it probably spends, people always ask how much time I would spend carving it. There's something with this amount of detail. It's probably like 20 to 30 hours of carving time, but it's just, it's definitely my favorite part of the whole process is carving the wood blocks. Um, and I'm just thinking a lot about formal, like silly little formal decisions, like where I want black to be and where I want white to be when I'm at that point, like just carving away. Um, those different things that I think about at different stages in the process. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the printmaking process briar. I was thinking some of your students might be here, so I put in some process slides for them, but they could look at the recording after if they wanted to. <laughs> um, so I dug out some process slides, uh, like just showing some of the stuff I do in the studio. Um, on the left, there's a couple of pieces of plywood that are kind of in the middle of being carved from that last series I showed you. Those ones are um, a type of plywood called Baltic birch. It's like a cabinetry plywood. I switched a few years ago. Um, I'm starting to react, I think, to the glue in the plywood, which has formaldehyde in it. Um, I was reacting in different ways, and I'm sure it's to that, from like chiseling away and being in that stuff for probably 10 years or more. So I switched to a different, more ecologically and health-friendly version of plywood since then. Anyways, <clears throat> anyways, I use a bunch of uh, small handheld tools, like you can see sitting on the wood there, like dozens of different ones. They have different shapes of the steel like cutting piece at the end like 
V-shaped things to make little sharp lines or bigger, um, like they're called gouges, like U-shaped gouges to clear out uh, areas of wood um, and chisels. And you don't have to carve very far down into the wood, just a millimeter or two, um, just enough so that um, you can see the images where I'm rolling out ink. Um, uh, that's how you roll out like an ink palette for relief printmaking. It's a really thin layer of ink that you're putting on this palette on glass and you just um, like repeatedly, I take that ink and transfer it onto the wood block until I build it up enough. So there's enough ink to get a good impression on paper when I print it. Um, so you don't have to carve very deep at all. It just needs to be deep enough that when I roll over it with that rubber roller, that it's not gonna ooze into the places I've carved. So, so I roll it up and the ink only sits on the surfaces that I haven't carved. So when people um, think about it or first try like woodcut or line of block printing, it's you have to wrap your head around like what's like the line that you want to carve is going to end up being white at the end with the paper showing through. So working a little bit in reverse that way, I guess. Also in reverse <clears throat> in that when um, when you print the, the piece of paper on top of the woodcut, you're going to get a reverse image of it. Um, here's a few pictures of me using the hand tool called a baron to get an impression from my woodcut onto a piece of paper. The pieces I work on have generally been so big that they're too big to use in something called a printmaking press, which a lot of printmakers would use a press to make a woodcut print. Um, but you can also print by hand, um, like I'm showing these images here. I have a bunch of different barons, these tools. Um, my favorite is the one on the bottom right called a ball bearing baron, um, which is good for printing areas with a lot of line work on it. It just gets a really nice impression. So usually I have my wood cut with ink on top and I put a damp piece of paper, printmaking paper on that. And then a little piece of backing paper, like this parchment paper kind of stuff. And then I, with a fair bit of pressure, I make these tiny little circular movements with the baron all across the whole wood block. Um, to get an impression from the wood block onto paper. If you have questions, just stick them in the chat and we'll get to it. Um, and this is uh, showing me by pulling a piece of damp paper off of the wood cut in the top right. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, that big uh, that big bird nest piece, um, because the paper is damp, I do something called stretching it after it's printed. Um, you've probably seen like damp paper getting all buckled as it dries. We don't want that to happen with a nice print. So I usually tape it down with some tape that can adhere to a damp paper and let it stretch nice and flat. So those are just a few images of some of the process. Um, so I'm just going to briefly talk about a couple other uh, types of work that are in the show. There's um, one wall in the show that looks like this. And it has, um, we can see a couple of nest images that I already showed you, but the other prints, um, the three prints that aren't bird nests, they're, they're um, square, like four by four foot prints. And they're from a series I did about sphagnum mosses. Um, it's about, I'm not sure how many pieces in that series, like seven, seven I think. Um, there's these three in the show. And essentially they're like, um, like oversized botanical studies of um, this group of plants called sphagnum mosses, in particular looking at them under a microscope. Um, sphagnum mosses are also known as peat, peat mosses, and they're like a really important group of plants that make up peatlands, they're a type of wetland. Um, they make up, like in Alberta, for example, about 20% of Alberta is peatland. Um, their habitats they're really diverse and they support all kinds of biodiversity. They also, one of the most important potential um, means of climate change mitigation that we have, that means like, um, well, you know, I'm sure you all know what kind of climate change mitigation means, but for these, it's about carbon capture and storage. Once peatlands form, um, there's this massive amount of underground undecomposed plant matter as the peat grows essentially is never going to decompose and give up that carbon. 
peatlands are like thousands of years old. Um, the water table is very high, so you have a plant growing like in and above the water table, and then underneath that, um, it's just this massive carbon capture system. Um, so there's a lot of potential there for like, uh, you know, the future of climate change mitigation. Um, that said, there's also like a lot of oil and gas activity in these same places, and um, you know, obviously there needs to be a balance struck between preserving as much of this as we can these peatlands. Um, so anyway, so I could get into that a lot, but uh, I collaborated with a bryologist, which is someone who studies moss, not biologist, but bryologist with an R, um, who happens to be my partner. He's a moss person. So I, um, when I first started looking at sphagnum, actually that last series I showed you, um, I first got into sphagnum because we share like a workspace at home and I kept getting stray leaves of sphagnum mosses on my microscope slides. And I thought they were just so beautiful. And I talked to my partner, Richard, and I'm like, what are these things? And so I started learning more and more about sphagnum mosses. And um, eventually I got him to do, well, he was doing his field work. I asked him to bring me back some specimens of some common species from Alberta. <coughs> Excuse me. So I ended up making like each of these prints is kind of a portrait of one species that I was looking at and the different kind of botanical structures um, in it. Uh, here's one of them close up. I mean, they look so abstract, nobody would know what this is of. Maybe it looks a little bit botanical. So I titled them something really prosaic and obvious, like called them sphagnum moss microscopy. So if you look at the title, at least you'll have an idea of kind of what it is. Uh, here's a few photos from Richard from the field. He's got a million beautiful photos of moss that I could pick from, but um, so this image on the left, is of a typical beet peatland. This is like a black spruce fen in northern Alberta. And it's just like soggy water. Like, I don't even know how he walks through this stuff. I think he sinks down to like his hip level all the time. It's just floating water and all covered in um, beautiful mosses and plants. This In the middle, there's an example of a sphagnum moss. I don't know what species that is. All of them have this red coloring, <clears throat> red coloring um, from different pigments in them. And then on the right, there's a single stem of one plant it's just they're so beautiful even like macroscopically like this but then with the specimens that he brought home for me I um I looked at them all under the microscope and started poking around doing sort of the same thing that he does but from an artist's perspective uh, I was really intrigued by this one type of leaf on the plants called a stem leaf so there's all sorts of different types of branchlets and leaves on an individual sphagnum plant um, one of them grows close up against the stem, main stem of the plant, and it's called a stem leaf. And a lot of them have this really loose lace-like structure. Um, they're really beautiful. All these images that you see here, like on the right, this is a little strand of a branch. And if you look at like one leaf on there, or one leaf here, there's these big open blobby shapes. Um, those are called hyaline cells, high allene cells, and they're um, like a special adaptation of sphagnum mosses to um, store water. Essentially they're dead cells, like dead at maturity, and they just like balloon full of water or when they dry out, um, shrink. Um, and they have like this blue stained image at the bottom, I added some stain to it to show these little white pores. Um, so you have this like big beanie sausage, like hyaline cell, and it's got these little pores that let the water in and out and these things called fibrils that spiral around it. So like the function and ecology of it is fascinating, but like just from a visual arts perspective, like there's so many beautiful things to explore and look at. Um, so I just like just scratched the surface um, with these prints starting to explore these sphagnum mosses. It's I think all of my these bodies of work I'm talking about are kind of ongoing. I don't think I've reached an end point with any of them. Um, but, you know, I find new interesting things that I want to explore and so jump off to kind of a new, a new topic to look at as well. Uh, this, was, this print is not in this show, but it's the largest one I made from that sphagnum moss series. I called it stem leaves and hyaline cells, um, kind of like the science you name for it. This is eight, an eight foot long print um, I 
like some of the other long prints I've showed you, big prints I've showed you are kind of like these scroll, like horizontal scroll, like formats, which I really enjoy for a number of reasons. But um, with this one, I wanted to do an oversized print where I wasn't limited by paper size. So I, um, I had to sort of stitch multiple panels of paper together to make this um, five, five feet by eight feet. And um, yeah, these like big net, like these white, open net like lacy things in the background. Those are they're just drawings that I did of those um, stem leaves, <clears throat> which on some species are really beautiful and look just like that. So even though again this is like totally abstract print, it's it is, but unless you're a bryologist and you recognize sphagnum leaves under the microscope, then you might you might know that there's something um, representational on here. Um, and then I just have a couple more slides. Uh, the last bit of work that's in the show, there's just two pieces from a series I did in 2021. And again, it's an ongoing body of work. But again, with the um, collaborating, in collaboration with the scientists, um, I can't see your picture under my screen here, but uh, this is Dr. Paula Fury. We first met like over 20 years ago studying algae um, in Victoria. BC freshwater algae. Paula went on to do that as her career. So she's a freshwater phycologist. That's someone who studies algae and limnologist. Um, and we like reconnected a few years ago, you know, and talked about like art and science and all the possibilities um, for combining the two. And um, so we like, I think in 2021, we just had a bunch of Zoom chats and they gave a guest lecture to one of her classes and she sent me all this amazing imagery. Like these are just a few examples. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, <clears throat> some of the things that I um, worked with of uh, hers. Um, she specializes in a group of diatoms um, called Eunosha. Um, a couple, there's a couple of them shown here. Um, and she's using all sorts of different kinds of microscopy, like scanning electron microscopy. Um, diatoms are like they're microscopic. They are like incredibly important for producing oxygen on the planet. The oceans are full of them. They're an ice. When I went to undergrad, like in 2000, like 20 something years ago, we classified them as algae back then, but now they're classified as protists, I think. Anyways, they are um, diatoms. These are mostly diatoms that you're looking at. They're super fascinating organisms. They have like a glass like a silica-based cell wall with all these like fascinating patterns on them. Um, anyways, I could talk about diatoms forever. I studied them for a little while, a long time ago, and Paula has been studying them for her whole career. Uh, so I just, again, just scratching the surface of this fascinating topic in ecology, um, I did a series of super abstracted prints, just looking at fresh jewels, like these glass cell walls and diatoms and some of the patterns on them. And looking at the work, this is, I think there's maybe like, again, like eight or so pieces in this body work. These are like, again, four or five feet tall. Um, this, this, this like body work doesn't necessarily look biological when you look at it. Most people, when they see these pieces, think like of cityscapes or blueprints or something human made. Um, and that's great. I like that about it. It can be read totally open in an open fashion. Um, I showed this work in um, Toronto that year in 2021, and everybody saw cityscapes, Toronto, high rises and stuff. So it's whatever kind of imagery you see. Uh, yeah, so there's a couple of pieces of these in the Korean show as well. Um, so that's the last slide I put in. It's like four years of work condensed into like um, 20 minutes or whatever. Uh, so yeah, that's all I have for chatting. And then um, I'd love to hear questions or comments or anything you guys have for me. I stop sharing that. Hi, my, hi, Lisa. Hi. Yeah, hi, my name is Ruth. I used to live in Kelowna. I now live on Vancouver Island. That was such a fascinating presentation. Thank you so much. Um, so I have two questions. Uh, one is uh, quite practical. The other one is a little bit abstract. So I'll start with that one. Um, 
so because you have turned the nests of birds into some artistry, um, it causes me to wonder what you think. And I know you, you can't probably say for sure, um, but when a bird creates a nest and they make choices about where they put the various pieces of material, and that was just fascinating to hear about. Um, do you think they consider aesthetics or is it purely practical? Um, that's a great question. I'm 100% sure. Okay, I shouldn't say that. I feel very certain in my humble opinion that they consider aesthetics. Uh, and like the first thing I think about is how on a lot of nests, not just that blue jay one that I showed you, but a lot of other nests I've seen, there's um, a lot of decoration around the outside of the nests. So the inside is very carefully like constructed for being a soft cushiony place for the legs and for the eggs to sit and the, the parents to sit on them. Um, and the outside seems like about like the decoration, like sometimes the males build the nest, sometimes the females build the nest. When the males build the nest um, in certain species, they're definitely trying to attract a mate and show off their nest building skills. So you've probably seen things in bird shows on TV and stuff before all the great lengths that males of certain species will do to show off to attract females. Nest building is one of those things. Um, um, you should look up bower birds in Australia oh. and see the amazing bowers that the male bower birds make. Um, so yeah, aesthetics, definitely. Oh, that, that's so great. Thank you for that. I, it yeah. kind of makes me almost want to weep. Um, and then, <laughs> so great. And then my other question is, um, you made a number of references to um, research that you've done, um, you know, prior to or as a part of your artistry. Uh, where might I find some of that research? I was just intrigued. Um, so, um, yeah, great. Thanks for asking that. So there's research, like, I talk about creative research. So as sort of an artist who's also an ecologist, I consider the things I do now research. And that might be like, you know, like I showed going to Point Peely and spending a week there recording bird songs or going to the museum and documenting birds. But the more sciencey research from when I had my first career, like as a, as a biologist, as a scientist, um, I worked for government for most of that. So any kind of like, research like stuff that got published is mostly in government publications and I did a lot of work with endangered species and I worked for a long time with Alberta Fish and Wildlife so if you googled my name on Alberta Fish and Wildlife you'd probably come up with like that kind of stuff like different species that I worked on like some flowers and some amphibians and some birds um, and then like what for like really hardcore research like my master's thesis in plant ecology um yeah you wouldn't want to read through that but it exists <laughs> so there's that oh, kind of research stuff out there as well that's wonderful thank you so much this was fantastic thanks Ruth hi Briar I have a couple of really simple questions one one is that you were talking about the cowbirds and and how they have a kind of migratory life when they when they lay their eggs in another nest who raises that is it the other the expecting the other bird is going to raise the and feed the the chick yeah they do and it's so fascinating so like say um say they lay their eggs in like a white crown sparrow nest um and the sparrows raise those eggs and they don't um like the cowbirds will grow up with the the sparrow nestlings beside them. Um, but somehow they'll still know how to be a cowbird and do their cowbird thing when they grow up. But yeah, they're raised by the other species in their nest. And is there is there any kind of animosity between the between the different species um, in the same nest? Do they yeah, with with cowbirds apparently there's there's not like they don't kick the other birds out of the nest or anything. There's probably some competition because the cowbirds are usually bigger. Um, than a lot of the species that they're um, brood parasites for, so they might um, hog resources a little bit from the native birds, but yeah, that's as far as the competition goes. 
And th thank you. That's that's terrific. And thank you for this talk. It's been it's been uh, terrific because it's sort of a, about art and other things, and that's always really nice. Yeah. Um, um, but, sorry, I just want to add one thing to the cupboard thing. There was a researcher I met when I was at the museum from the University of Manitoba. It's from Winnipeg for sure, and it, I think it was University of Manitoba rather than University rather than the University of Winnipeg. And his whole career has been studying yellow warblers and round headed cowbird ecology. That's pretty cool. My, my my other my other question, if you, I don't know if you can do, do this easily, but could you go back to like the second last slide? Sure. Yeah. I should have just kept my sharing screen up. Second last slide. Oops. Um, the diatom one. Yes. Okay. What is that thing in the lower right corner? Oops. What does what does it just do? Oh, there. This thing? Yes. Um, it's a diatom. Um, a dead diatom. It's my super microscopic. So, um, what it says twenty micrometers. So that's like, um, what two thousand of a millimeter. Um, it's a dead diatom, so it's just the glass um, cell wall that's left over from a diatom, and it's um, uh, the, called the valve view of a diatom. So um, they usually kind of, on the other side at the bottom, you can see sort of a three-dimensional picture. That cylinder, you could look at a cylinder like face on and just see the circle of it, or you can look at it from the side and see the long cylinder shape of it. Same with this guy um, that you're talking about this um, funny little shaped thing. I don't remember what genus this is. And so you're looking at like the equivalent of the flat circle end of it and turn it on the side and it'd be a little bit thicker. Anyways, glass cell wall with this fascinating pattern on it. Yeah. And and so the the image in the upper left corner, is it more of that? More of those cells? Yes, of different species. Um, and probably it, oh, it looks maybe like the same type of microscopy. Yeah, different species of diatom. I, I, I was for a while when you while you were talking, I was convinced that it was some sort of embossing on paper. They, yeah. they it's quite striking that that has a very printmakerly thing up here. It does. Yeah, that's the it's called like I think it's um something with light refraction in the title for the type of microscopy it is that gives it that slightly three dimensional feel. Uh, yeah. I, I first saw diatoms, like, I remember my, I had a great high school biology teacher who was an ecologist, and he introduced us to diatoms in grade, like, 10 or 11, and I remember seeing images up on, it was an overhead projector back in those days, he had, like, an overhead projector with the, with the transparency with a picture of diatoms, and I was like, what are those beautiful things? How can something that amazing exist in the world? Um, anyways, yeah. Well, that, that the upper the upper left corner image. I mean, both both the lower right corner, corner image and the upper left corner image really are fascinating to look at. But they also really uh, you can start seeing where the the combination of things and the way you're putting things together are coming from. Um, you know, from off of the slides that uh, the microscop microscopic slides. That mishmash of things is quite lovely. Yeah. Yes. And, and so, have you ever made any any blind embossment uh, pieces? Like Oh, that's a great question. Um, so uh, for other people listening, you mean like an embossed print without the ink on it? Yeah. Um, yeah, for other people listening, like um, so typically like with a, a relief or woodcut print, you're putting a lot of pressure on the paper to get it to push onto your plate to get an image. You can do that without ink on there if you had a, a damp piece of paper and get like um, like the surface like a three-dimensional kind of surface on your paper from where it's squished into the places that you carve. Um, I don't usually do that because I'm printing by hand. I'm usually printing on um, Japanese papers that are really thin. Um, and they don't give you that kind of embossment. So um, so I haven't done a lot of that. I would love to, Briar, if I had a press that I could run some of these woodcuts through onto a thicker like a cotton rag paper. Um, yeah, I haven't done embossment on prints since. I have done blind embossing in the past, but not since I've had access to a giant press <laughs> like 10 years ago. Yeah. 
Well, maybe next summer. Our press isn't giant, but. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I already have plans for next summer. I'm excited. Awesome. Great. Thanks for the question. Well, thank you. That's great. Evelyn, you got a question for me? I don't have a question, uh, Lisa, but um, it's just fascinating to hear you speak about your work, which I haven't yet um, had that experience of um, a deeper explanation and the broad the broad number of um, subjects, you know, that uh, you're drawn to. Um, it's just when we go on our nature walks, I know that your eye is drawn to so many things that I probably don't see. Uh, well, I know I don't, and uh, but I just uh, appreciate uh, your um, what you see in nature, and uh, what you draw out of uh, what you see, and it's just um, beautiful. I I don't. I'm sorry, but I don't have a question. I just want to make a comment that uh, I'm happy to be here, and I appreciate uh, this. Um, yeah, this video. Thanks, Evelyn. <laughs> and we're looking forward to seeing you in February. Yeah, thank you. I have um, a, a show coming up at uh, Martha Street Studio in Winnipeg in uh, February, March. And Winnipeg's where my in laws, Evelyn, live. So it'll be a fun trip. Okay, anybody else have any more questions or comments? If not, I would just like to say I did look up the bowerbird. Uh, very cool. <laughs> very cute. I love that you guys should just look it up. But it says, I just read a little line. It says they build nests that decorate and decorate with objects of a single color. And it's so cute. Um, Anyways, thank you so much, Lisa. That was great. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for being with us and taking time out of your night to do this. So yes, thank you very much. And you guys can look for this on our website in probably a week or so we would have it up. So yeah, thank you so much. And um, everyone have a great evening. Great. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, <laughs> okay. everyone. Bye.